If you're a John 15, say amen. Amen. Greater love hath no man than this. That a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father have I, I have made known unto you. Let's place our Bibles down and let's, let's talk to our friend this morning. Jesus, we love you. We need you. I pray for revelation, for understanding, for that proverbial light to come on in the hearts and the minds of any and everyone in this place today and those listening online, God. We're looking for a, an amazing move from our friend as we, Lord, apprehend one another, God, for the plan of salvation, for eternity, for all the things that are important. Lord, I pray and ask for your help today as I try to bring forth the understanding of what a friend we have in Jesus. And everybody said amen. God bless you. You can be seated. This this week, and uh, I know that he doesn't know what I'm preaching, and I don't know what he's preaching, but my longest running real friend, and we're just a couple of years away from 40 years friendship. Now, you know you're old when you got friends that long. I hope you're so lucky as to get this old. I'm just trying to catch up to Brother Davenport. Amen. I, it's good to have friends, but there's all, kind of, all kinds of friends the Bible talks about Ammon having a friend, but it wasn't a good friend. It led him to trouble. A real friend won't get you in trouble. Sadly, I learned that one. A few uh, problems, troubles, and incarcerations too late. But I'm thankful today for almost 38 years of friendship with uh, Brother Monroe. And he's probably just finishing up preaching in South Carolina right now. and We got to talk this week and uh, I hope that you have some friends that yes. that are like that and towards the end of this message maybe I'll expound that on that a little bit but I like to think that a friend is someone who will go to the ends of the earth and back for you just because you asked a friend is someone who will help you when you're right and they're honest enough to correct you when you're wrong. A friend is someone that just doesn't stick around because it looks good. They're, they're not there just because of you being a benefit to them, but they look to be a benefit to you. If Sometimes we, we don't understand when Jesus said, you are my friends if you do what I command you. You have to understand, friendship is a two-way street. You just... Anybody ever had those friends that all they do is take? That ain't, I like the fact that Jesus first gave. Talk about a friend. Man, I never, I can't catch up. You ever had a friend that so giving and so loving and so, that, wow. A friend is a person who one knows well and is, you're fond of. Someone that's in a close acquaintance, a person let me put it this way, on the same side when there's a struggle. One who's not an enemy, not a foe. A supporter and sometimes a sympathizer. Amen? Someone that's helpful and reliable. I want to talk about that today. Talk to you about something that is probably one of the most precious things you can possess. A friend. Friends are like good health. You don't realize what a gift they are until you lose them. Howard Hughes, the billionaire, once said, I'd give all my wealth for one good friend. A friend is someone who knows the truth about you and 
loves you anyway. A friend is someone who comes in when the whole world is walked out. As we read in Scripture, we come to realize that in spite of our weaknesses, our proclivities, our, our fail, failures and shortcomings, that God is not just fond of us, but he loves us more than we can imagine. One of my favorite verses is in Jeremiah 31 and 3. It says, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and I can't help date myself a little bit. I remember riding the school bus back in the 70s when that song Everlasting Love would come on. I can still hear that sound of that, that, that keyboard in that. Romans chapter 5, the Holy Spirit beautifully expresses uh, the love to us when Paul writes, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. And he kind of helps us understand it. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. In other words, it's hard to get anybody to do something for a good person. Yet he died for us when we were bad people. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Taking this a little bit further, let us consider what Jesus told his disciples. He said in John 15, 13, greater love has no man than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. Let me qualify that with Brother Monroe, Matt Monroe, I'll call him from here on out. He jeopardized being an acquaintance at work to try to become a friend by reaching into a, a scoundrel's life and talking to me about the greatest friend that I didn't know I needed, Jesus Christ. You ever, you ever, it may not be, it may not fit you, but it fits me. I was one of them, you didn't talk to me about God. I was an angry young man. I had lost my father as a teenager, and that, for some reason it kind of sent me spiraling. Some of you have overcome worse things like a champ, but, you know, it, it kind of derailed me, and I became an angry person, an insecure person, a person that just, I didn't really allow myself to have friends because I felt that they were always trying to get something and take something from me because it was friends of my father that were a part of what happened to him. Wallet goes missing and things like that. So I just had no trust and I was just an angry, bitter person. But I'm thankful that Brother Monroe became a friend to me. Matt Monroe became a friend to me. And that friendship that he learned biblically, he stretched out to me, risking me. And I mistreated him. I, I was a cook and he was a bus boy. You know this a little bit. I let, let the pan sit on there just a little longer with them refried. and let him just beat them bad boys on there. And I go and throw, I need this in five minutes. It's mean to him. I would take, after cracking some eggs open, I'd fill it with guacamole, and I'd go through the, 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 to the back door, and he'd be back there washing dishes, and I'd do my best impersonation of Nolan Ryan, and some of y'all don't even know who that is, but that's a baseball pitcher. Just antagonistic, because I was angry, and he was happy all the time, and he had something that I didn't have, and that bothers people sometimes. But I'm, I'm thankful that he endured my anger and saw through that. Jesus laid down his life to save us from our sins and our bad attitudes, our bad actions. If you're here today and there's things there, he can love you past it, through it, to, a, to another place. He wants to provide for us eternal life. That's a friend. What a friend. In addition to knowing all these bad things about us, he loves us. And he doesn't want to just love us. He wants to be an intimate friend of ours. How many people, you know, really want to be an intimate friend to you and still like you? And you can tell them the secrets and you can tell them about the junk in your trunk. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you hear what I'm saying? Some of us, boy between our garages and our closets and our trunks, we got a lot of 
a lot of junk and baggage and skeletons. I'm thankful for a God that I can help you with that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. See, I live long enough to know you. everybody will be around for the loaves and fishes, but you start talking about, hey, we're having a church work day. Hey, man, I'm cleaning out my garage. It's, oh, man, I, I, I love that. I got, Jesus is right there. You have to realize that, that, that Jesus wants that intimate relationship with you. And so he set before each and every one of us an open door. It's a great metaphor because I have a lot of people that come, not, man, what is it about right now with all these people going door to door trying to sell solar? I, I literally, I still got a little suspicion about me. This guy come knocking on the door asking about solar. And I, I heard my, my wife, she answered the door. And I'm like, uh-uh. So I go running out there and I didn't look my best. I was wearing a pair of sweats, flip-flops, and one of my crazy patriotic T-shirts. And uh, kind of bow up a little bit, you know. Kind of hard to do when my stomach sticks out farther than my chest now. And I, and I go, y'all don't understand it yet. I go stepping outside. I'm like, there's solar on my roof. You can't see that? See, so you know, now I'm trying to be mean. You have to understand the world I came out of. You're casing my house. You can you what you think you're gonna get something over my wife? I just stood there. He walking down the street, he keeps looking back. I'm like, that's right. He said, What? I said, I got solar on my roof. You casing my house? I'm trying to work on my friend's side, you know. But I got these gigantic panels as, as, as big as this platform on my roof, and you come and ask me if I want solar? That's like me standing there with a whole bunch of food asking me if I'm hungry. <laughs> Does that make sense? I don't know how I got off on that, but anyway. I'm glad that Jesus even sees that part of that. Come back in here, man of God. Let me get you to be more friendly. I was just worried about my house, my dogs, my... My wife, my daughter, and man, I didn't need that joker coming back in the middle of the night. That's just, you know. And so Jesus opened the door for us to be born again. In other words, a new start. To become a child of God, to be born into this thing. You see, a lot of people want to cheapen it and just, oh, just accept Jesus as your person. You know, I can accept a lot of people, my friends, but actions speak louder than words. Didn't it not say that he died for us while we were yet sinners? And he invites us to be born again so that we can become saints. John chapter 1, 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave, and this version says, the right. How about the opportunity to become the children of God to those who believe in his name? Mm -hmm. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor of the will, but of God. I want to be born again because I've got a friend that sticketh closer than a brother who loved me at my worst. Listen, you got a lot of people in your life. And there are some friends in your life, but even your spouse will look at you some days when you're having a bad day. Uh -uh. And all the married people say, oh, Pastor's right. There's some day. Go back to bed and get up on the other side. Or I'll see you later. You. Jesus will walk with you when you're being a complete idiot. When everybody's running and got you locked up in chains and throwing you in the graveyard, Jesus will come walking along and I can still help you. What a friend. What a friend. You see, he's a better friend than any spouse. Remember that. In fact, I can't even be a good spouse unless I got that friend Jesus helping me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Amen. A friend is someone who's on the same side in a struggle. That's why it's important to have a savior and a spouse, because sometimes my spouse is my struggle. And sometimes I'm my spouse's struggle. Ask her. She's right there. 
I didn't come here to tell you a bunch of lies and how fluffy and frilly and fun life is. Sometimes it's not. And when it's not, you need a real friend. You need a real friend. That's who I'm talking about. Jesus is on our side in a struggle. You see, sometimes you, you're fighting with your spouse or you're fighting with someone in your house. You're fighting with your Jesus ain't on a side. He's on his side. You get on his side, it'll all work out. I'm, I'm thankful for that. But let's not forget the whole reason he came. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. You see, that's what it's about, folks. Jesus is not our enemy or foe. He's our friend. He wants to be our ally in this world. He wants to be that helpful, reliable friend that stands with you and helps you walk through the valleys and the mountains and the struggles, the good days and the bad days. You know, to understand this a little bit more, he used the Apostle Paul and he wrote something in Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Let me help you with that. You know that inside voice that makes you... That fool just cut me off. And you want to tell them they're number one? And that little voice in your head goes, don't do it? That's that help. You see that person walking by and you see him drop some money that little voice in there. Give that back. Don't put that in your pocket. God helps you become not only just a great person, but a loving, extend that love. For You know, someone that I'm not looking to take advantage of anybody. I'm looking that I could be an advantage for somebody. Isn't that what Jesus did for you? Jesus helped us get a lot of getting. He's blessed us. Why would we turn around and be stingy? Was he not giving to us? You see, the more you're around someone, the more you're supposed to become like someone. Everybody say, I can do all things through Christ. Tell that to your neighbor. I'm going to be better when I leave here. I'm going to be a better friend than I've ever been. Mm-hmm. Jesus is reliable and he's faithful. In fact, in Matthew 28 and 20, it says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. Anybody have anybody promise you and didn't stick with the program? Oh, yeah, made a lot of promise. Jesus, he keeps his word. He keeps his promises. Like I said, he, he seems to walk in when everybody else walks out. We need to understand this a little bit more. Hebrews 13 and 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. You're so busy trying to get so many other things that you're missing the most important thing. What a friend. Why would I be so busy and work all these hours at a work and miss an opportunity to come to the Lord's house? Why would I spend all this time trying to get money, trying to get things, when what I really need is my best friend, the greatest friend? He's the one that'll never leave me, never forsake me. I'm thankful that over the years of my life, I had some great bosses. I had some great job pay, a lot of money, did a lot of wonderful things. But when it boils down to it, what did the billionaire say? I'd give all my wealth for one good. I wish I could have told him. I can tell you who he is. I've walked, I get to walk with him and talk with him. He gets to be my, whether I'm rich, whether I'm poor, whether I'm hungry or I'm full, he's a friend every day. And he's, he's my greatest friend. He's the one that said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear what men can do. And I don't care if y'all like me or not. I want you to. But I want to be right with God first. And if I'm right with God, even my enemies can be at peace with me. 
Deep down they know, you know, hey, he ain't really trying to do nothing to me. He's just trying to live for God. I'm the one messing up. Mm -hmm. I'm constantly in awe of the fact that Jesus is not a God that's distant and far away or some cold statue or some sort of ceremony, but he walks with me and talks with me. I got up this morning with my heat, feet hit the floor. The first words out of my mouth were Jesus. Been that way for a long time now. Jesus loves you. He cares for you. He's an intimate friend. I can say this. He always has your best interest at heart. Always. It may not feel like it all the time, but when you boil it all down and see life is lived going forward, but it's understood looking back. It, when you go through something, it don't make sense, but when you're mature enough to live that, now I understand. Now, See, the reason teenagers get so upset at their parents is they want everything their parents worked 50 years for right now. They don't understand. You can't have that because you won't know how to take care of that, and it'll hurt you and not help you. And so that's why teenagers get so sideways with parents is they don't have enough understanding to, well, let me put it, sit down, shut up, and just listen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You ever notice older people get, the quieter they get? You do yourself a whole lot better by listening than talking. If you're talking, you're not learning anything. You're regurgitating what you already know. But if you'll listen, God could teach you some things. Jesus is the best friend anyone could ever have. He's a better friend than your spouse. He'll help you in that situation. I'm thankful for the compassion that we get. We know that he looked on the multitudes and saw them as a flock of sheep without a shepherd. How many of us have meandered through life and maybe missed out on a lot of great things? That was me. I was doomed. I was doomed. And I look back now in that, that hindsight and realize when I allowed myself to have a friend like Jesus to shepherd my life, wow, what a friend. What a friend. He's always had my best interest at heart. I got jobs I never should have had. I got to places I never should have been able to go. I got to do things that were never going to happen for me until I met Jesus. He had compassion on the multitude. The Bible says his heart was heavy because he saw their sin thankful for a friend that knows we're messing up and says, I don't want you to suffer those consequences. Imagine having a friend that doesn't want you to suffer consequences and is willing to say, hey, listen, I can save you from that mess. He felt that way so much. The Bible says he wept over them. Can you imagine having a friend that weeps over your struggles? I'm sorry, I lived long enough. I've watched my friends laugh at my struggles. Well, maybe y'all don't understand what that is. In fact, I, I've been robbed from. I came home one time, saw that my window had been pushed open. I was robbed. This is B.C., before church. I jumped in my car, and I went flying down the road. I found two of my buddies walking down the street. And I pulled over and I accosted both of them, searched their pockets and found out they're the ones that robbed me. Jesus has never robbed me. I can honestly say, I, 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 I he, he's never even thought about robbing me. He's never thought about taking advantage of me. I wonder why it is that some of us are so cheap with the church and so real with people out there. Jesus never robbed you. But to understand, most of those people out there, even your relatives, are looking for what they can get out of you. It's human nature. I'm thankful for a God that loves me. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus stopped right in the middle of a sermon because there was a man there that was physically ill. And he, right in the middle of what he was doing, Jesus stopped what he was doing and healed the man. He allowed children to crowd and get on. He held up every, all the hold up adults. I got time. I'm not have time for these children. Mm -hmm. He even had a late night meeting where he met with this guy that named Nicodemus 
at a late hour, he was confused. Jesus took time for this guy. He broke all the ceremonial religious rules and healed someone on the Sabbath day because people were more important than all your ceremonies. I'm glad to know that that's me in that place. That's me. You see, 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 when you start to see things that Jesus did for people, he'd do it for you and he'd do it for me. And he'll stop right now. And if you need a healing, he'll touch you. He'll reach into your heart and reach into your mind. Help me, I need a friend like that. Jesus even risked his reputation and hung around some folks. Oh boy. He got close to some folks of questionable character. You know why? He cares so much he couldn't help himself. What a, what a unique offer we get from Jesus. Offering something no one else can, salvation. Mark says in chapter 16, he said unto them, his disciples, listen, if, if you're going to be my disciple, I want you to be an extension of my friendship. Friendship isn't selfish. It doesn't have the mentality, well, I got everything I need. Let me just shut my door and my... I got what I, I'll just show up for church whenever. I'm not going to be a part. I'm not going to sac sacrifice. I did that. If not. No, this is what he says about people that go ye into all the world. You know what he's saying? Go find someone to extend my love and friendship to. Preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth on his back. See, some of us, we're so caught up, and you got to be baptized in Jesus' name, and you do. You got to repent of your sin, and you receive the Holy Ghost, and you do. But do you realize what precedes all that? Friendship. Love. Not stuff. Not things. People. People. Listen, how many's done something? Now, don't raise your hand. Done something just out of nowhere. You just knew someone. You just handed them maybe a couple of bucks, or maybe you bought them a meal, or you, or, or you helped someone with. What a anybody ever felt that feeling? It's a wonderful thing. Can you imagine doing that and you're helping someone get to heaven? You know, I'm just going to cover a few people here that stick out in my heart and my mind that, that Jesus stopped everything for. And maybe you can place yourself in their shoes. Zacchaeus. Nobody liked him. You know, Christian, he was a little guy. He was a little, just, just obnoxious, money-grubbing character. I'm not describing you, just the little guy part. If you get money grabbing, I'll tell you. But he deserved the reputation he had because he was money grabbing. He was a tightwad. Look, look, if you want to change your narrative, change what you do. Let me tell you, you, you won't do it on your own. You got to get close to Jesus. Because you need to be like him. And so here he is, Zacchaeus, this little guy, and this whole crowd of people. Nobody parted for him or helped him. Nobody liked him. But Jesus stopped everything he was doing. Walked over to that ridiculous tree he was up in. I said, you know what, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. I don't care who you've been. Jesus is walking up and down and saying, ah. I'll come home with you today. I'll come home with you today. Oh, no, 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 no. And guess what? Zacchaeus is really a, a pretty good guy compared to this next character. They drug her in front of him, this adulterous woman. Guilty, accused, alone. And can I say something painful that we don't like to hear when it's true? She deserved her situation. 
That's a two-edged sword in a good way. They brought her to be judged because they wanted her condemned. And how many of us should have been condemned and possibly even now, but because you brought for Jesus. Oh, no, I'm, I, yeah, I'm a judge, but I'm also the greatest friend. He gave her another chance. You know what he said? Hey, I'll take care of all that. Go and sin no more. Can you imagine a friend that gives you another opportunity? Create a new life. I'm telling you, Jesus does that. You, you get a, when you leave here today, you get a brand new clean slate. Do it all. Get it. Get all. You get do overs with Jesus. You know. You know. I, I, I'm the antithesis of, of of people that want to be important. If you want to be in the spotlight, you're going to find yourself in darkness around me. If you're caught up in the title instead of doing the job, now nah, have a seat. And Jesus kind of had a bit about of that, of that about him. You know, this blind Bartimaeus was on the roadside and another crowd. Instead of instead of Zacchaeus up in the tree and an adulterous woman being drugged to him, here's a blind man. They just told to shut up. Anybody ever been told to shut up? How about life telling you you're unimportant, you're too damaged, nobody wants nothing to do with you? I like the fact that Jesus stopped the whole thing. He's important to me. Life in the world and people around you and your closest friends or so-called friends may not make you feel important, but this, this, this Jesus thinks you're pretty important. Remember what he did while we were yet sinners? He paid your way. You just got to accept the ticket. And he gave him a new life. I could go on. The wild man of Gadara. I spoke about it a minute ago about the chains and some of you being tossed aside by family and friend. They didn't want to deal with you anymore. Jesus, Jesus is not afraid of your problems. He's not afraid of your mess. He's not afraid of that. But if you look at what happened to him, he did something you got to remember to do. And that's why church and, and prayer and, and the stuff that we talk about is so important. Because you find him clothed and in his right mind at the feet of Jesus. You can't skip church and be close to him. You can't. You can't. It's impossible. He understood something. Now I got Jesus. I want to be right at his feet. I want to stay right there. But you know what Jesus did? Wait a minute. That love that I extended to you and you, nobody wanted to deal with you. Nobody wanted nothing to do with you except the demons. He was at the feet of Jesus and he wanted to go with Jesus. He says, no, 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 no. Go to your friends and go to your family. Why? Go show them the love I showed you. Yeah. This is that's really what Friends Day about is about today. Who's your friend who came with you today? Because you knew what Je know what Jesus has done to get you where you are today. How about the woman at the well? She had to go there at that time because of who she was and what she'd been doing. All her husbands, she's had so many husbands, you run out of fingers to count them. She's a mess, but Jesus said, no, I must needs go. He was saying, I, I had to meet her. No one else was going to do it. No one else cared. How many of us don't even realize we were just like that and Jesus went out of his way to find what a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. So, you know, when you need a friend, you need Jesus. You know, you when you need another chance, you need Jesus. Uh, when, when you need another opportunity, you need Jesus. Because he, he brings all that. Uh-huh. He already knows your resume. <laughs> 
The Bible tells us in 2 Chronicles, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the whole earth. He's looking at you every day. He's watching you because he cares. God will never force himself into your life, but he invites you to seek him. Acts 17 declares, and he hath made of one blood all nations. All this racism junk they're trying to pop. Uh uh. The church took care of that years ago. All nations of men for to dwell all the face of the earth and have determined the times before appointed in the bounds of habitation that they should seek the Lord. If happily they might feel after him and find him. Listen, he's right there. He's as close as the mention of his name. It goes on to say, though, though he be not far from any one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. He's right there right now. There's an old song that we don't sing it around here. I wish we would maybe bring this one out and dust it off. He was there all the time, waiting patiently in line. And it's true. With all the stuff you're chasing and all the things you're doing, all that you think about, all your drama, all your mess, uh, all your privilege and all your priorities, he's waiting in line. Declaring, come to me. All who are weary and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and humble. You shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He chose us. He chose the church. Because he, he knows we need to gather together because we need one another. He wants us to be faithful. In fact, the church started it in an upper room where he told them to gather. Acts chapter 2, 1 through 4. They gathered together and were praying, and he moved. Acts 10, uh, Hebrews 10 and 25 says, don't forsake gathering together. Gather together. He goes on, we're two or three are gathered. There he is. There's something about gathering. There's something about being faithful. He, can I put it to you like this? He'll even love and reach for people who hate. Mm -hmm. he'll hate. He'll love people that hate you. Talk about a great friend. There's a man by the name of Saul. It says in Acts 9, he was breathing out threatenings and slaughters against the disciples of the Lord, against the church. Went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any Christians, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. The Bible says, as he went, he came near Damascus, and then suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. I'm pretty sure if we were all watching, yeah, get him, God. Get him, Jesus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And it says that Saul said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Can you imagine at your worst, most hateful, threatening, killing self, Jesus reaching for you? The Bible says, Paul, as he trembled and was astonished, said, Lord, what do you want me to do? The Lord said to him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what, he, what must be done. Do you know what he's doing? He's preparing two friends for this guy. Yeah. Think about that. Two friends. What, what it, he needed God, but how was he really going to get Jesus? He needed two friends that understood, that knew. Think about that. If, if there's someone that needs God today, are you one of those friends or are you too busy? Are you one of those friends or you got too many other little trivial things to do? Aren't you glad someone reached out to you? 
If you read the entire chapters of, of eight and nine, you'll find Jesus brought two important friends into his life. Ananias and Barnabas. Wow. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But this is what Jesus said to him. Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel yeah. unto me to bear my name. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus. This guy who's persecuting the people of Jesus said he's going to go in my name and do things in my name. Ananias, I need you to go be a friend. What kind of friend? You need to be a friend like I'm a friend. Yeah. Jesus is telling the church today, I need you to go be a friend like I'm a friend to you. Go be a friend. Be a friend. Because this guy's going to be a friend that reaches to the Gentile. That's you and us. That's you and I. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. This is what he says, and he laid hands on him. You know what he said? Brother Saul. Wow. Jesus is a pretty good friend. Wow. The Bible says that, and I said that the Lord sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Wow. How many are a friend like that? Are you, how many that God can take and send you to somebody? But that wasn't all. You see, you read further down in, in the book of Acts chapter 9, and when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But the Bible says they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was disciple, but Barnabas took him. Talk about a friend. Yeah. He knew he needed an Ananias to teach him the truth. Uh -huh. And a Barnabas that would introduce him, say, no, wait a minute. This is a good brother now. He's on our side now. He serves Jesus. Now. I'm telling you, we all need an Ananias and a Barnabas in our life. And that we need to turn around and be an Ananias and a Barnabas in somebody else's life. You think about it. Ananias and Barnabas helped change the world because they were willing to be a friend to a Saul who became a Paul. Eventually, Paul would become the most important missionary in Christian history, a leader equal to Peter and John in the early church. How many millions becoming Christians have been freed by the plan of salvation preached by Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 38? Paul joined in this effort, and Cornelius and his family in Acts chapter 10 continued. How many marriages today have been saved by the words of 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter? How many of us have gone and read that and realized I, love is kind? Oh, some of us maybe need to go read it again and become a, a friend like that. How many anxious hearts have been calmed by the peace of God that passes all understanding or the knowledge that God can work good out of every situation? How many are thankful that God has used those scriptural concepts for centuries, for millions upon millions of believers? I'm one of them today. Thank you, Barnabas. Thank you, Ananias, for being a friend to a Paul that preached and taught that you and I can read it today. I'm telling you, friends make a difference. Friends make a world of difference. I've been changed by those words of Paul. Thank God for Ananias and Barnabas. Thank God for a God that's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You flash back to that day when Paul lay crumpled in the dirt on the outskirts of Damascus. And that bright light and overwhelming situation where the Savior had just taken place. He's lost his eyesight. 
He lost his spiritual foundation because everything he believed was not true. Some of you need to realize some of the junk you've been believing is not true. And Jesus has something better for you today. And so here he is on the dirt, on the ground. His, his, his religion been shattered because he found out it was false. Now he's emotionally drained. And God's, that's okay. I got an Ananias and a Barnabas. Yes. Go, Thank God for good friends. Yes. Thank God for friends that will change the world. Yes. You know, God works in simple ways. Somewhere, perhaps today, right near you, right now. Or maybe you kind of neglected and blew this service off and you didn't invite anybody or you didn't bring anybody. And you realize that you might be the answer to someone's need. You might be the friend God has called to be in their life. It might be you who changes their world, and they may change the world on a level you never comprehended. Come on. You see, we need friends. The Bible says in Acts 8, and Philip was looking, and the Spirit, the Holy Ghost told him to go and join himself to an Ethiopian that was in a chariot. Oh. Mm -hmm. Acts 8, it says, and he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had, he had charge of all her treasure. And he came to Jerusalem for to worship and was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and join thyself. Why? He needs a friend. Can the Lord speak to you like that? Go and join you. They need a friend. And Philip ran. He didn't dawdle. He didn't meander. He says, well, I'll wait for them. That. No, he went and did as the Spirit of God moved on him. And he ran thither and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand us what thou readest. And, and, and the Ethiopian made a great statement. How can I accept some man guide me? Or how can I say it this way today? How can I unless I got a friend to show me? You see, I needed a friend too. I was a mess. I had lost my dad and I was angry and I was willing to do anything. And God sent me a Matt Monroe into my life. And almost, almost few, well, about three years, two years away from 40 years, he's been my friend. Mm -hmm. You see, this Ethiopian needed a friend. Saul needed a friend. And God provided friends. The greatest friend knows how to provide a good friend. Are you a good friend? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. Quick friends. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, Pray thee of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And they went on their way, and they came to a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. What a friend. What a friend to stop everything that's going on. What a friend to stop everything that's going on and say, you know what? When you know it's time to get baptized, we'll stop everything we got to do and we'll baptize you. Come on. Come on. Randy, we're stopping everything for you today. Face this way. I want you to sit down, put your feet out. This is what it's about. This yeah. is how you take on the name of Jesus. I'm thankful that Randy's got a friend in Christian, and he's got a friend in Brother Joe, and he's got a church full of friends realizing that the most important thing you can do is repent of your sins. He knew they had to have a friend. They needed a friend. 
Christian's been a friend. Joe's been a friend. We need a friend. I just didn't want to miss this. How's that water? I'm guaranteed. Oh. Put some bubbles and it'd be yes, a sauna. God, Jesus, hallelujah, God. Oh. It was so important to be baptized in Jesus' name. Jesus said in Mark, go into all the world, we're baptizing them in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. Yes. Uh, it's okay. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going to have to turn this off for the sound because of that speaker. Face. And then you're going to grab your wrist with this hand. Yes. I'm going to lower you down and back up, but oh, you hang on, okay? Jesus. He's going to obey Scripture. This yeah. is why Jesus went to Calvary. Yes. So that we'd have a name that's above every name. A friend that's sick closer. To, a real friend will lay down his life. Jesus did that. A real friend will lay down all their pride and all who they think they are to tell you about Jesus. Randy, upon the confession of your faith and in the name of Jesus Christ, I baptize you for the remission of your sins. <laughs>